Well, welcome everybody. It's good to be with you here today at Zarephath Christian Church. Can we just say hi to Cheryl Gleam and the others who are watching us online right now? Let's give them a hand. <laughs> Even though we're glad to be with them today. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm going to start us out this morning talking about a guy named Clive Staples. Has ever, anyone ever heard of Clive Staples? One, two, three, four. Good. Thank you. All right. We're off to a good start. See, Clive Clive was a devout atheist. He, he was brilliant. He was very sharp, very direct. And he was absolutely certain that there is no God in the universe, that life was completely up to us, and we just had to make it up as we go along. Strongest man wins. But the thing was, his life changed radically and suddenly in his relationship with God because of something that he found out about happiness. And we're going to come back to that in, in a, a few minutes here. See, the thing is, we were made for happiness. We, we were created in a way that we can experience happiness. So that's why we pursue it. But the thing is, we don't often catch it. We don't catch it in a way that satisfies the whole of our being. We're going to be talking about that a little today. See, the thing is, have you ever felt like you were chasing your own tail? Have you ever felt like your solution sort of just recreates the problem, but you don't know what else to do? And so you go back to the most predictable source of comfort that you know? That might be food, might be sex, might be gossip, might be shopping, might be work. See, the thing is, if there was any place on earth at any time in human history where people as a nation would have caught up to happiness, it's right here, right now. We live in one of the wealthiest nations on earth. Praise God. Uh, we also live in one of the wealthiest parts of that na nation. Now, we have longer lives. We have faster transportation. We have more access to more stuff than has ever been possible in all of human history. Name one thing that you cannot get on Amazon. Don't say happiness. That's going to ruin the joke. <laughs> all right. So we have chocolate. We have pizza. We have internet. We have smartphones, right? We, we have literally mapped the human genome. So we have more control over, despite COVID, despite what we've been going through as a, a, a world right now, we have more control over life than anybody in all of history has ever had. We should be the most self-fulfilled, happy people the world has ever seen. Are we? Why are we not surprised when our celebrities, who are multi-million if not billionaires, commit suicide. Why doesn't that surprise us? But why is depression off the charts, even before COVID? Why was that on the rise? Why is polarization in our nation so extreme at this point that either side doesn't really have the hope of getting anything worthwhile done working together with the other? How do we get there? In the, I, I love the uh, film Lion King. Everyone watch Lion King? Yeah, I love that film. So Timon is one of my favorite characters, yeah? And there's this one scene where Timon is standing in front of the lions. He's going, what's going on? And his whole jaw is aghast, yeah? And that, that's sort of like the mode that I think a lot of us are in right now, right? We didn't start here. So, so what's going on? How, how did we get here? See, the thing is, our nation grew from our, an idea. And that idea is that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this is now a moral imperative in our culture. Anything that stands in the way of my pursuit of happiness violates my right to life and liberty. As far as we're concerned, happiness is why we exist. A, a life of liberated, individualized, personalized happiness is our nation's highest value. So, so why aren't we all the happiest people the world has ever seen? See, the thing is, from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible lays out this pathway of choices that we make along the path of what the Bible calls a blessed life. 
And there's a center point to all those choices. And we're walking into a two-week series here. We're going to look at two things that Jesus said everything else hangs on. It's a series called Chasing Happiness. And it's taken right out of our Declaration for Independence as a Nation, the pursuit of happiness. And here, in this context, it centers around two themes. Loving God with everything that we've got and loving our neighbor as ourselves. Now, today, we're going to look at the first one under the title, Chasing Our Tales. And we're going to start off by reading in John chapter 4. So I'll just invite you to turn there right now. And as you're turning, I'll just uh, start us up here by asking us the question. Let's pause, put life on pause for just 20 minutes here. Have we caught up to happiness? Are we satisfied? Or do we relate more with these guys? Let's take a look at this. I had a dog who would chase his tail. When he, found, when he caught it, he would yelp and let it go. <laughs> Next one. Cat, and it, we've had kittens and played this game forever, and I, I just, you start feeling sorry for the cat because he, he just never quite <laughs> catches the dog. Next one. And then a hamster on a wheel. A hamster we do still have. Um, here's the thing. We were made for God, and we were made for each other. And if we try to meet a spiritual or relational need in our own little bubbles, consuming everything we can get our hands on, what that does is it just reminds us how inwardly empty we really are. So, so what do we do with that? What, what do we do with that feeling of emptiness in our pursuit of happiness when we experience that? We go consume more stuff, right? So, so the hamster wheel just keeps turning. We feel empty, so we go consume more stuff. That just reminds us how empty we are. So we resolve that problem with the most predictable source of comfort we know, and the hamster wheel just keeps right on going. They say that the first step in getting out of a hole is to stop digging. So let's do that. Let's pause here and ask the question. We're going we're gonna to listen to a few people from Scripture um, who confronted that exact same issue. One was a king, one was a lawyer, and one was a lady that nobody really wanted anything to do with. And we're going to start with a lady. Um, she's a Samaritan woman, and uh, she met Jesus at a well in the middle of the day. So let's pick that up in John chapter 4, uh, verse 4. Now, Jesus had gone through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews don't associate with Samaritans. <laughs> now, there's a lot going on here, right? So you, you got this lady. First of all, who goes to do that kind of work in the middle of the day when the sun is hottest? I mean, carrying water, if you've ever done that, that's hard work, right? So most people do that hard work in the morning because the, the weather's a little cooler. Second thing is, who does that alone? I mean, in village life, I don't know if you've ever experienced village life in the Middle East or in Asia, but village life, you don't do anything alone. If you're walking along the path alone, people assume you're going to the toilet or something like that. So, so something's definitely off in this picture here, right? So she gets to the well, and she ignores Jesus because he's a Jewish guy. She's a Samaritan woman. So she's experienced nothing but contempt for people like that, so she ignores him herself. And then Jesus, he breaks all the social rules, and he asks her for a drink. So now that's way off, right? A, a, a Jewish male teacher asking a Samaritan woman for a drink, that's way off socially, right? So now they're both sitting there at the well. They're both misfits, and that's the conver conversation starts up at that point. So she's looking at Jesus, and she's thinking, you want a drink for me? 
But wh what are you thinking? Uh, you're a Samaritan, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. You, people like you don't ask people like me for a drink, for any kind of help. You don't relate to me. She's trying to figure Jesus out here, right? See, the thing is, this lady really had issues. I mean, her, her issues had issues, right? And the thing is that her, her coming to the well at midday, that happened because the blazing hot sun was kinder to her soul than the judgmental stares of the village women. And so she gets there alone. She gets there and she sees Jesus and now there's this Jewish know-it-all in her quiet place, right? She waits till everybody else has come and gone. She goes there to her place where she can be alone, can be private, and now she sees Jesus there. She's thinking, great, the one time I get my own space, and now this guy's, this guy's sitting here. And that's, that's sort of the conversation that she was having when Jesus said, would you give me a drink? And so what's going through her mind when Jesus says that to her, will you give me a drink, is you don't get it. it you really don't get it. I would pollute the water just by me giving it to you. I would pollute the water. So how, how could you possibly ask me for a drink? But you know that, you know that moment where you suddenly realize that God is totally uninterested in the game that you've been trying to win your whole life, and then he offers you a new one? Let's come down to 13. See how Jesus responds to this. He says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Wouldn't that be nice? See, Jesus' words here echo a prophecy in the book of Jeremiah where God was talking to the people of Israel and what he was saying was, you have left me, the fountain of living water, and you've gone into the desert to dig holes. So what this lady is saying is, living water, sure. I'm dying. Nothing has satisfied me yet, so maybe this will. Give me some of that. And now comes the choice that Jesus came there to give her. See, the thing is, Jesus is, <laughs> Jesus is the master of turning these abstract, contentious social issues into concrete, personal choices. And that's exactly what he does here. Let's go to verse 16. He says, go, call your husband and come back. First choice, confession, I have no husband. So Jesus says, yeah, that's quite true. You're actually on number five and counting. So what you just said, that, that's true. That's a true statement. So she's looking at him like, oh, so you're a prophet and you want to fight. All right, I can do that. I've been fighting these people all my life. I can definitely fight you. Let's talk about place of worship. If this, if this well is good enough for Jacob, why isn't it good enough for you Jews? But then see, Jesus' response makes it clear that he's still not playing that game. He's not playing her game. Let's go see what he says. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. See, here's the thing. God is the center point of worship. It's not my group. It's not your group. It's not my style. It's not your style. It's not my favorite song. It's not your favorite song. It's not my tribe. It's not your tribe. God is the center of worship. And whatever happiness-chasing club you happen to be part of, you need to understand that this is a God who is chasing you. 
This God is a fountain of life, not a well in the desert where you have to dig a little deeper every day to get what you're looking for. Do you know what happened? In that moment where Jesus talked to her about true worshipers who worship in spirit and are set free from their own history, she started to believe. This is what she says. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. That's her second choice, to believe. You know how you drink living water? You drink living water by acknowledging the God who made you for himself. See, when you realize that this God is for you, he's not against you, that he has a plan in mind when he made you, that he has purposes that he wants lived out through your life, the only possible way to respond is worship. And as we worship God in spirit and in truth, he, he fills our whole being with a revelation of himself. Well water, whatever kind of well water you happen to be going to, whatever's your favorite spot, it's not going to do that. I wonder, maybe that's why born-again Christians sound so arrogant when they talk about Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life, right? Because the thing is, when you drink living water, you know what you found. You're not chasing it anymore. It's sort of like this. If you have been trying to use seawater to quench thirst, little drops of seawater to quench your thirst all through your life, and then one day somebody introduces you to fresh water, you take a gulp of that and you know exactly what you found. And you're not chasing it anymore. That's, that comparison is not hate speech, people. That, that comparison is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus, Jesus had a way of helping people find meaning and happiness by looking in the right places. And he did that here with the Samaritan woman by revealing to her who he was. Now, now people didn't always respond well to that, right? Right? That actually got him killed later on in his life. And at another time in his ministry, Jesus was a little more direct, and uh, this time to a very different audience. In uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 34, Jesus was asked about the greatest commandment. And this is how he started. He said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now, there's a second part to that. We'll look at that next week, but we're going to start here because that's where Jesus started. So let's, let's look at these things. Loving God, God with our heart. See, our heart refers to our desires, and loving God with our whole heart, talk, it, that gets us off the hamster wheel because it talks about the way that God transforms those very desires. Let's unpack that a little bit. In a psalm, uh, chapter 37, it says this, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. In other words, what he's saying here is if your delight is in the Lord, you will be satisfied in a way that nothing else can satisfy because you were made for him. Next. Another verse is in Matthew chapter 5. It says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. That's a promise of God. This comes out of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for they will be filled. They will be satisfied. And then Paul kind of develops that idea in Philippians chapter 2 when he says this, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. In other words, your very will is transformed by the presence of God in your life. God gives you not just the will to act, but the power to do so. Really and truly, that's what happens in worship. See, see worship is not just singing songs with some great musical background. Worship 
is our spirit relating to God as spirit. I, uh, I asked Adam Rothman to, uh, to work with me on a more meaty definition of the word worship because it's so central to what the Christian life is. And, uh, and here's one we came up with. Worship is the submission of our mind, body, and soul to God's person and will. The celebration of a life redeemed. Worship is deep calling out to deep and the only way our deepest needs are ever satisfied. And it is the only proper response to the gravity of God's glory. You know the word holy in, uh, in Hebrew? It has a sense of weight to it. There's a sense of the, the gravity, the, the, um, the weight of God's glory. And that's what we savor in worship. And you know, every single aspect of your life can be an act of worship. Isn't that awesome? See, the thing is, like, like when my kids were young, um, they would watch a hero movie, and for the next few weeks, we would have echoes of that hero movie bouncing off the walls for, uh, for a long time. Whether it was Zorro or Captain America, you know, whatever, whatever those were, um, our two kids would be little echoes of the hero that had captured their imagination like that. They became like the hero. They started talking like the hero. They started relating like the hero, taking action like the hero. And that's really what happens as we worship. As we worship, our attention is on God. As, it, he, as he reveals himself to us, we want to reflect what he reveals to us. We, we want to be like him. The whole of life comes alive with his presence and his purpose as we live every facet of our life as an act of worship. A father in the um, very early church named Augustine, he wrote this. He said, our hearts were made for thee. Our hearts remain restless until they find their rest in you. You know why that is? Why our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God? It's because God is the only one whose name is I am that I am. See, God doesn't need us. He loves us. God is complete in himself, but he's chosen to set his love on us. Literally everyone else finds their meaning, finds their identity, finds ultimately their existence, ultimately in God himself. And if you reject that, I promise you, your search will end in emptiness. I think that's why a self-absorbed consumer mentality leaves us empty, because we were made in God's image, and so we were designed to experience joy in the context of relationship. That's how we're wired, not locking ourselves in our little bubbles. That's not how we're designed to really experience joy. Joy comes from the soul, and let's talk about that. Loving God with our soul talks about the deepest parts of us. Our, our soul, that's, that's why justice resonates so deeply within all of us. Our soul is why loneliness hurts so very, very much. It's why it's understandable when people are ready to die for things that they believe. The soul is where morality really matters, where, where mercy comes to life, where grace that we see in the cross of Jesus Christ makes us weep. The, the soul is the place from which you relate, is the place where worship really comes from in ways that your mind can't express. The psalmist actually talks about this, and he says this, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. I think that's what we lost as a culture. When we turned away, when we rejected the idea of a creator, we did exactly the same thing that Israel did as a nation. And God speaks to that nation. This is what he said. 
He said, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they've dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. See, God calls himself the fountain of life. You don't have to dig for a fountain. A fountain comes to you. A fountain is seeking you. And that's exactly what Jesus was echoing with the woman at the well. See, when we walk away from the fountain of life and we walk into digging our holes in the desert floor, this is essentially what we're doing. We, we work 24-7 and then we buy expensive gifts and Hallmark cards for family that we never see. <laughs> we don't have time for coffee with people around us, so we, uh, we put a few likes on Facebook, fooling ourselves into thinking that we've related to them when in reality we've just consumed a slice of their life. See, we've, we've become so hypersensitized as a culture to our own needs for affirmation, that if our social media post gets a thumbs down, we have an anxiety attack. It's happened. <laughs> Here's the thing. If we try to create our own version of heaven on earth because we're collectively convinced that happiness lies outside the other direction from our Creator's intent, our lives will ultimately end in emptiness. See, the thing is, right now, in our culture, all we need for something to be right is for it to make me happy. That's my truth. It's, it's much like with the, the Samaritan woman, right? The, the pursuit of happiness has become a highly personalized affair. But it wasn't originally. If you look at uh, President George Washington in, in his speech where he was actually declining the offer of a third term of presidency, this is what he said to his nation. He said, for democracy to work, it must be accountable to a higher power. Could you imagine someone saying that on CNN today? Our first president said that when he declined his third term in office. See, 200 years after he said that, we kicked God out of school. And so now we come to the well alone, in private, wondering what this religious guy is doing here in our happy spot. <laughs> there was actually someone else in the Bible who chased happiness down to the ultimate end, and he had all the resources to do it. His name was Solomon. You can read his journal in the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon said this. He said, I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Now, I'm going to blow this whole story here. This is not how he ended the book, but it is how he started the book. So I'd encourage you to read that in your own time when you go back tonight. But the thing is that that, that chasing after the wind, that ultimate meaninglessness, is not where we have to end up. It's not the only option in life. And that's really where worshiping God with our mind comes in. See, Jesus offered the women at the well a choice. And this is where loving God with our mind engages. Actions are a result of choices. And they say that um, identity is established in the act of choice. You can track back who you are through time with reference to the fact you made that choice there. This is where we establish who we are and who we're becoming. That, I think that's why confession and repentance are so absolutely vital pieces in our walk with God. It, no one can repent for you. No one can repent for me. I have to do that. You have to do that. That's something only we can do. 
And when we love God with our mind, our rationality, our decisions, what we leave behind us as a consequence of the decisions we made as we seek to acknowledge Him in all of our ways, what happens is our life and the, the fallout of our lives that we leave behind us starts, it's not that we're perfect, nobody's perfect. The only perfect person who's ever lived is Jesus, okay? But as we seek to serve Him, as we seek to acknowledge Him in all of our ways, our lives look more and more different than the people around us. And that's exactly what Jesus was talking about when He said this. He said, sanctify them by the truth, your word is truth. And he said this as he was praying for not just his disciples, but all believers. See, the thing is, God's word is truth, not just as an objective fact, and not just in our subjective experience of that, our feelings about it. God's word is true because it's true in God himself. That's where all this flows from. That's where the experience of worship is grounded. And when we submit to that truth, when we live it out, when we, that makes us what Jesus calls light, salt, in the world around us. Do you, let me give you an illustration of that. Have you ever forgotten to add salt to your scrambled eggs? You know, you know that you're eating breakfast and some, mm, something's missing. Everything's missing. What is that? Salt. If you, if you forget to add salt to food, it, it loses not only its ability for you to taste it, it also loses its ability to sustain itself over time. It'll just rot. But see, the thing is, we lose our saltiness when we turn Jesus into a commodity, something to be consumed on our own terms in our own little bubble. Forget repentance. Just convince yourself that you're fine. Identify with sin. Don't, don't struggle with it. Identify with it. God's good with that. That's, that's a blasphemy of the gospel. That, that is denying people the salvation, the hope, the joy, the peace, the life that is found only in Jesus Christ and telling them they should be satisfied with dry holes in the desert. That's not why Jesus came. But when we market Jesus in that way to our culture, <laughs> they hear an echo of themselves. And they ignore us because they recognize dry holes in the desert. They've been digging them their whole lives. They're still digging them, still chasing that tail, still making the rounds, still on the hamster wheel. See, the thing is, let's get back to Clive Staples. Clive Staples is a person we all know as C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis spent his, the, the first part of his life arguing vigorously that there was no God, that the only thing in existence was these dry holes in the desert we build ourselves. But then he asked a new question one day. Why do we keep digging? <laughs> He put it this way. He said, if I find in myself a need that it, this world cannot fulfill, the most reasonable explanation is that I was made for another world. And from there, C.S. Lewis became one of the most prolific, profound, impactful writers of his generation. For, from his book, Mere Christianity to the Narnia series, his writings are global, literally have gone internationally all around the world in many, many languages. That's salt, that's light, that's, that's what truth does. That's the gospel. And right now, for some of us, there, there's something burning inside you that agrees with that. You're not sure you want to, but there's something inside of you that agrees with that. That something is the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. And this is what God is saying to you. In Isaiah 43, he says this to Israel. He says, I made you. You are mine. You are precious in my sight, and I love you. I would encourage you to read that chapter, Isaiah 50, 43. 
See, here's the thing. Right now, if God is speaking to you, then your heart is begging your mind to let your soul respond to that. And just like the woman at the well, or the lawyer that was challenging Jesus, or Solomon in his palace, you have a choice to make. If you know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, if you know that new life that can be had in Christ, your choice is going to be how do you talk about this Jesus? Are you going to market Jesus as another commodity to be consumed? Or will you bear witness to the lordship of your Savior with an attitude that says, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for all you've done. That releases joy. If you don't yet know that, if you don't yet know what we're talking about with that, that life welling up inside of you, then let me just invite you to that right now. See, the thing is, our sins really have separated us from that relationship with God that we were designed for. And our sins created a debt that we can never pay in and of ourselves. That's why Jesus came. He came as the perfect sacrifice to pay that debt. And now that true life that Jesus came to, to bring can be yours. And it's yours as you believe in him, as you trust your life to him. And if that's something that you want, if you're listening today and you're, there's something inside of you saying, I know that's what I've been missing, I'd invite you to pray with me right now. Oh, Jesus, you came that we might know life that abundant life that you designed us for. Father, we confess that we've lived our lives as if we were God and you were not. But you are God. And Lord, we confess to you that we have sinned. We've gone against your will and your ways. And Father, we turn from that and we turn to you. Jesus, your blood was shed for me. I receive that amazing gift from you, I, I receive the righteousness that you give me, Lord God. Give me that life that's true life. Make me alive in you. Hold me close to you, Lord. We love you.